So the verse I am talking about is going to be Galatians 3, and the verse we're going to is 20, but uh, let's start with 18 and come down to 20. So Galatians 3.18, For if the inheritance be of law, it is no more a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now here's verse 20. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Now that, that to me on its face is just, is just, what the heck does that mean? Right? It's almost like, it's almost like it doesn't mean anything. It's almost like there's no context to it. Um, but it's absolutely incredible what it means. And, and notice here, it says God is one. And what do we talk about these past few minutes where the Godhead, God, one God in three persons, the first member of the Godhead, the second member of the Godhead, and the third member. Of course, the third member is the Holy Spirit. The first member of the Godhead we now know as Father. And the second member of the Godhead we now know as Jesus. But this God is one. In love and in unity, they are one. And remember, they, the whole reason the Father sent the Son into the world, the whole reason the first member of the Godhead and the second member of the Godhead took on role of Father, Son, was to show us this relationship to get us on the inside of it, to get us on the inside of one. But the interesting thing here is, um, it says now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. In other words, a mediator and a covenant, you know, if you have, say, you have two tribes coveting with each other, you know, say this tribe is, you know, um, they grow food, you know, they're farmers, but this tribe is a warrior tribe. So two tribes like that may come together because they make a more perfect whole together than they do apart. So each tribe makes promises to the other tribe and they cut a covenant, you know, they kill the animal, the blood spilled, signifying if you break the covenant, you will be killed. So in cases like uh, uh, two parties coming together in a covenant, you would have a mediator who would then be the go-between in the middle to represent both parties to facilitate the covenant. You know, and so I'm sure most of you are familiar with this as Christians. You know, so a mediator comes between two parties, but here it says God is one, you know, which is interesting. So why have a mediator? There's not a mediator of only one. A mediator has to have two to be the go-between. So what is absolutely brilliant is you have, again, the Godhead is one. The first member, the second member, the third member. But what's happening now is why there is a need for a mediator is because now the first member of the Godhead is going to make promises to the second member of the Godhead. So there's the two. Yes, they're one because they are just God. But remember, God wants to become, he wants to come and become a father and he wants to send a son to show us this relationship that the one God has. Matter of fact, that's why God is one because they're so united in love for each other. They are one and they want us to be inside that oneness. I mean, just, I mean, you guys are already seeing it in your spirit, the peace and the joy and the safety you have of being one with God. That's what we have in Christ. Um, and it's, gosh, it what puts me to bed at night and what gets me out of bed in the morning. I mean, it's life itself. So when you so now we have to deal with the mediator. So now we see the two, the first member of the Godhead is going to make promises to the second member of the Godhead. So now you need a mediator. And now most of the time when, if you go to like all the commentaries on this verse, they'll talk about something about, oh, Moses was the mediator. And then, you know, because they associate Moses uh, with the law. And of course, rightly so. Um, but that's, that's not really what he's talking about here. What he's talking about is picture God being one. So you have the first member of the Godhead and you have the second member of the Godhead. And... And now go with me on my story. I will, I will clean it up doctrinally in a minute, but I'm going to kind of give you a fantastical story to make a point. So we know that God called Abraham and made promises to Abraham. So think of it this way. Think of God so one with each other, so in love with each other that 
that the first member of the Godhead can't take his eyes off the second member of the Godhead. The second member of the Godhead can't take his eyes off the first member of the Godhead. And of course, the same is true with the third member, the Holy Spirit. He's just as much God as Jehovah is, as the Father is, as Jesus is. But remember now, we're, we're coming, a covenant is being made between two, between the first member of the Godhead and between the second member of the Godhead. So the Holy Spirit has his role, but let's just leave him to the side for now. So think of the first member and the second member, so in love with each other, they can't take their eyes off each other. They're just so one. And so, but they want to somehow communicate this love to us. So they somehow need to separate themselves. So like, you know, picture them so close together and it's like, okay, how can we separate ourselves? I know, we'll, we'll get a mediator to come up here. So let's call someone from the earth to come up here and squeeze themselves between us to kind of separate us. Now remember, this is kind of a fantastic story that I'm going to use to make a point. So, so God calls Abraham and basically says, Abraham, come up here. I need a mediator. I need you to squeeze yourself between me, the first member, and who will in the future be known as Jesus, but now is the second member. I need you to squeeze yourself between us and be a mediator because I'm going to make promises. I, the first member of the Godhead, I'm going to make promises to the second member of the Godhead. So I need you to mediate this covenant I'm going to make with him. So what this means is, so God then makes promises to Abraham. You can go back through Genesis 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. I think it basically goes up to 24 is um, Abraham's story where God uh, promises that he'll be a blessing. He promises him land. In him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. In his seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So God makes promises to Abraham, and of course, we, that's where we really get a good picture of faith, is because Abraham believed the promises and God counted it to him for righteousness. Now, that was an accounted righteousness. Abraham, through his faith, he couldn't be made actual righteousness yet because Jesus hadn't come and died. But that's the point of the covenant, is remember, the first member is going to make a covenant with the second member. But in... but as Abraham comes in between them and mediates this covenant by his faith. In other words, all the promises you read to Abraham, they're not really to Abraham. Or, or let me put it to you this way. They are to Abraham, but indirectly. Directly, they're through Abraham to the second member of the Godhead who's going to take on a body through Abraham's loins. So um, we could... Let's look down at Galatians 3.16, makes this a little clearer. Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not and to seeds as in many or as in plural, but as of one singular, one singular seed and to thy seed, which is Christ. So in other words, that's the second member of the Godhead who now has a body through Abraham and through the lineage of Israel, you can read in uh, Matthew and Luke early on, the first couple chapters, uh, where uh, it shows the lineage of Jesus and how Jesus got his body. So when God is making promises to Abraham in Genesis, you know, Genesis 12 through 24 is his story, he's really making those promises through Abraham to Jesus. And then once they are fulfilled in Jesus, then of course, Abraham gets them. So let, let me clean that up a little bit. So all these promises are basically fulfilled to Abraham's seed, seed singular. Um, let's read Galatians 3.16 again. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He says not into seeds as of many, but as of one, into thy seed, which is Christ. So when Abraham had faith and it was accounted unto him for righteousness in other words he kind of had righteousness put onto his account it, it wasn't actual righteousness yet because Jesus hadn't come and died but through Abraham's faith and then the faith following you know Abraham 
Isaac, Jacob. You have the 12 tribes, the nation of Israel. The law gets instituted. All this was to get Jesus into the earth, you know, I don't know what, 1,500 years later. So these promises are made to Abraham. He believes them. And because Abraham has faith, God can now come through Abraham as a mediator and his seed to get Jesus into the earth to whom the promises were really made. So every promise God makes uh, to mankind that you find in the Bible is basically fulfilled in Christ when he is risen from the dead. So what's interesting is now that that first covenant is fulfilled in Christ by his resurrection, that covenant is fulfilled, it is, it is over with. In other words, that's not the covenant we have. Now that Jesus is risen, we have another covenant. It's called the second covenant. Now let's shoot over to Hebrews so we can clean this up. This is just absolutely incredible what's in the word of God. All right, so now with Hebrews 8, and if you have to pause the tape, go ahead. Let's start with verse 6, Hebrews 8, 6. But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant. Now we're talking about Jesus as a mediator of a new covenant, and we're going to explain that in a minute. Because remember, he's risen from the dead. So now that, because check this out. The Abraham was a mediator between the first member and the second member. So Abraham, through his faith, uh, he basically gave Jesus his body through believing the promises. Um, the second member of the Godhead could, Godhead could get a body and come to earth. And we know him as Jesus. And then when Jesus died and paid for sin and rose from the dead, that was God fulfilling the first covenant. And now since that's fulfilled, now Jesus is the mediator to the second covenant. So the second covenant is, the, is the, what God has between you and I, but you're going to be surprised at how this turns out. So verse 6 again, But now has he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Verse 8, for finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, when I, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continue not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, says the Lord. So what's going on here is that first covenant that is indirectly to Abraham, but through Abraham, it is directly to Jesus who fulfilled it when he rose from the dead. So when it says here that when he took them out of Egypt and they, they, uh, he regarded them not because they kept not their covenant, what he's talking about is the law you know, the Ten Commandments and all the laws of the uh, Old Testament was added to the Abrahamic covenant. But of course, as if you've heard any of my other teachings, and of course we can prove to you uh, out of Romans 7, is we could people couldn't keep the covenant. In other words, God kept saying, uh, stop sinning, but ultimately they couldn't stop sinning. You know, so the Tenth Commandment, don't lust. Don't lust after your neighbor's goods, your neighbor's wife. You're like, okay, God, I, I love you. I want to I follow you. I want to obey you. So I'm not going to lust after anything that's not mine. You know, but the problem that this man found was the more he tried not to lust, the more lust just overtook him and forced him into the sin. You know, so this man is sold under sin. That is the condemnation, is God is going to tell me to do something I can't do and I'm going to fail and be condemned. You know, it's a court of law. God in a court of law is proving that you and I, of course, in the case of Romans 7, it's the Jew, but he's holding up the Jew as an example for everybody that, that you cannot, that we are not righteous. He proved it by giving us a commandment to keep, but when we couldn't keep it, he proved we were sinners. But then like in a court of law, the gavel came down guilty, but then God in his mercy and grace poured that judgment onto Jesus Christ. 
And of course, Jesus uh, paid the price and we were set free. But because they couldn't keep the law, we therefore, or because the Jew couldn't keep the law, he kept breaking the covenant. So therefore, since the covenant's broken, God says, I'm not going to regard you. But what did Jesus do? He came and paid the price of, that, of people who could not keep the covenant. Jesus himself fulfilled it. Jesus kept every jot and tittle of the law. He dotted every I, crossed every t. Uh, t. He never sinned. So this covenant, remember, that wasn't really to Abraham or to his seeds, as in plural, many people. It was more through them to Jesus who kept the covenant. He was the only one who could keep this first covenant. Then he died in our place, and when he was risen again from the dead, the first covenant was fulfilled. Now you and I get a second covenant, not the first. The first is fulfilled in Christ. Now we want to look at the uh, second covenant. Uh, verse 10, Hebrews um, 8, 10. For this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. So now it's no longer is it a Ten Commandments given from the outside in as written in stone instructions that we are to keep that we can't keep. But he's going to go ahead and write them in our heart, give us a nature to keep them. That's the born again life. I will write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. So the second covenant is the, the gospel. What the gospel calls each person to is basically this. Hey, you come to me, and as you come to me and accept me, accept Jesus as Savior, that's your end of the covenant. So the covenant is if you, here's what you do, if you come to me in Christ through the gospel, I will, God says, write this new nature. I will write my laws into your heart. I will make you a new creature. You know, the, the, uh, the law is really just a description of what a new nature actually is. So he's like, I am going to put this nature in you. That's God's part of the covenant. So remember, a covenant between two is each side has to do something. So we come to God, God writes his uh, covenant into our hearts, gives us a new nature, gives us a nature to keep his laws. And then the covenant is fulfilled. What's interesting is once you accept the second covenant, you no longer have a covenant. Now let's look at that a little further. So uh, let's look at uh, Hebrews 9. My gosh, this is so awesome. So Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause, he, talking about Jesus, is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator lives. So what is he saying here? So now that Jesus has fulfilled the first covenant, Every promise made to and through Abraham, uh, Jesus kept. And of course, every, uh, or, or was made to Jesus, fulfilled in Jesus. And then, of course, the law was added to that covenant, which none of us could keep. So everybody had broken the first covenant. Every Jew who was commanded to keep it broke it. But not Jesus, because Jesus was born from the get-go with life in his spirit. His was the only candle lit in a sea of extinguished candles. He was the only one with life. So in other words, he kept the law added to the first covenant. He kept the first covenant perfectly and then died in our place who couldn't keep it. And then when he rose from the dead, that first covenant was completely fulfilled. And now God is making a second covenant uh, with us. And basically what the second covenant is, is when you come to God, he puts his life in you. In other words, when you come to God by accepting the gospel, that fulfilled first covenant in Christ is now put into you. So you, if you want to put it this way, if you want to say that you have a covenant now, you have a covenant with a fulfilled covenant. And we have much more to say about that. I mean, the absolute guarantee and surety of 
uh, spirit, soul, body of all your life being taken care of and secured in God is inside the fact that you have a covenant with a fulfilled covenant. But I don't know if we'll get that to that today. So back to Hebrews 9 is now he's looking at the covenant as a last will and testament. So for example, if somebody leaves you a house, it means it means that house does not belong to you until that person dies and then the house goes over to you. They left it to you in a will. That's what it says. A, a testament is only a force after men are dead. So what it's saying is now that Jesus uh, is dotted every I, crossed every T of the law, he's kept the first covenant um, perfectly, he now dies to give us an inheritance. Well, what, what inheritance do we have now that Jesus has died? We have the fulfilled covenant that he fulfilled, dotting every I, crossing every T, that that now is passed on to us. That's our inheritance. But here's the interesting part, is the inheritance Jesus died to give, which is the life in him, the life that keeps the first covenant, that is put inside of us. That is our inheritance. But in order for that to be our inheritance, the same Jesus who died to give us an inheritance, remember, you can only inherit something if somebody dies. So the same Jesus who died to give us this inheritance, he rose from the dead to actually be that inheritance. So he died to give us an inheritance of his life. And he rose, of course, to be that life that is the inheritance we receive because he died. I mean, I know it, it's all folded in on itself. God is an absolute genius that pulled this off. 